Every freshwater system runs on a limit. Most of the time, you never see it. But in summer, that limit can be crossed overnight. A lake can look perfectly fine in the afternoon and be lethal by sunrise. That's an oxygen crash. And if you fish lakes, rivers or canals, you fish in systems that can tip over very quickly, especially in summer. Fish don't breathe air. They extract dissolved oxygen from the water through their gills. That oxygen enters water in two main ways. From the atmosphere, through wind and surface movement, and from photosynthesis, when plants and algae are active during daylight. At the same time, oxygen is constantly being used by fish, insects and invertebrates, by bacteria, and by decomposition taking place on the bottom. A healthy water is a balance between oxygen going in and oxygen being used up. An oxygen crash happens when that balance breaks and oxygen is consumed faster than it can be replaced. Summer puts water under pressure before anything goes wrong. Warm water physically holds less oxygen than cold water. That's basic physics. At the same time, Fish are cold-blooded. As water warms, their metabolism increases. For most freshwater fish, metabolic rate, and therefore oxygen demand, typically increases by a factor of two or more for every 10 degree rise, though the exact response varies by species and temperature range. So summer creates a squeeze, less oxygen available, more oxygen required. That means many waters are already close to their limit during hot, still weather. Now here's something that catches a lot of people out. Yes, water often cools slightly overnight, and cooler water can hold more oxygen. But that isn't what controls nighttime oxygen levels. As soon as the sun goes down, photosynthesis stops. Plants and algae stop producing oxygen instantly. Respiration doesn't stop. Fish keep breathing, insects keep breathing, bacteria keeps breaking down organic matter, even algae consume oxygen in the dark. So overnight, oxygen is only going one way, down. The small cooling effect can't keep up with the biological oxygen use. That's why dissolved oxygen reaches its lowest point just before sunrise, a moment known as the dawn minimum. That's when fish are under the greatest stress. Not all oxygen drops are the same. Some waters experience a daily cycle. Oxygen rises during the day, drops overnight, then recovers after sunrise. That's stressful, but survivable. The real danger is system collapse. When oxygen drops day and night with no recovery. That's where our nutrients, algae and sediment come in. Algal blooms are driven by nutrients, mainly nitrogen and phosphorus. And those nutrients can enter water in two main ways. The first is external loading, which includes agricultural fertilizer washing off fields, sewage overflows, and urban runoff from roads and drains. These inputs add fresh nutrients directly into rivers, canals, and other water systems. In flowing waters especially, they can trigger blooms downstream. And when those blooms collapse, oxygen can crash rapidly. This pathway is real, well documented and damaging, but it's only half the story. The second is internal loading. In slow moving or closed waters, nutrients don't have to arrive from outside. They can already be stored in the system. Fish turn food into waste, dead algae sink, plants die back, organic matter settles. Over years, all of that accumulates in the sediment. A thick silt bed is not just mud, it's a nutrient reservoir. In warm conditions, oxygen disappears at the sediment surface. When sediments become anoxic, phosphorus is released back into the water. No pollution event, nothing you added. Summer simply unlocks nutrients that were already there. 
Blooms don't kill fish because they appear. They kill fish when they collapse. Warm, still, nutrient-rich water allows algae to multiply rapidly. The water turns green. During daylight, this can even raise oxygen levels, which is why blooms often look harmless at first. But the system becomes fragile. Dense algae block sunlight, killing submerged plants. Nutrients are exhausted and cells weaken. When the bloom collapses, bacteria swarm in to break it down. And bacteria consume oxygen continuously day and night. Photosynthesis is gone. Respiration explodes. Oxygen now falls everywhere with no recovery by morning. That is a true oxygen crash. Lakes, rivers and canals fail in different ways, but the end result is the same. In summer, many lakes become thermally stratified. Warm, oxygen-rich water sits on the surface. Colder, bottom water is cut off from the atmosphere and slowly loses oxygen. That deeper water can become completely unbreathable. The danger comes when a storm hits. Not because the rain is cold or anything, but because wind and wave energy break down the layers. When stratification collapses, oxygen-poor bottom water is mixed upward into the zone fish were relying on to survive. That's why many oxygen crashes don't happen during heat waves. They happen immediately after storms that physically mix the lake. Rivers usually protect themselves through flow. Moving water adds oxygen and carries waste away. But during droughts, flow drops. Water warms and dilution disappears. Add an organic input and bacteria can strip oxygen faster than the river can recover, creating an oxygen sag downstream. Canals are also vulnerable. They're shallow, slow, and frequently loaded with fine sediment. Boat traffic resuspends that silt, releases nutrients, blocks light and fuels bacterial activity. A triple hit that can push oxygen over the edge in hot weather. In oxygen crashes, anglers often notice something grim. The largest fish seem to die first. This is a consistent field observation reported across fisheries, but the exact physiological reasons are still being actively studied. Several explanations are likely working together. Larger fish have higher absolute oxygen demands. They require more oxygen overall just to survive. Some researchers have suggested geometric constraints that body mass increases faster than gill surface area, but this remains debated and gills can remodel in some species. Other factors that may also contribute are behavioral differences, reduced anaerobic tolerance, and metabolic limits under stress. What matters for anglers is this. In real oxygen crashes, the biggest fish consistently hit their limits first, regardless of the precise mechanism. Warning signals include fish piping at the surface, especially at dawn. Fish packed into weirs, inflows, or aerated areas. A sudden colour change or a foul smell. An entire water switching off in hot, still conditions. If fish are already gasping, the crash has already happened. An oxygen crash isn't about blame. It's about physics, biology, and limits. Freshwater systems run on a thin oxygen budget, especially in the summer. And when that budget is blown, it blows fast. If you see fish actively gasping, holding station at the surface, or clustered around inflows at first light, this isn't normal surface behavior. That's oxygen stress. At that point, it's not a feeding opportunity. It's an emergency. Report it to the fishery owner or environmental agency as soon as possible. If you've enjoyed this episode, Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next one. This is Hooked on Predator Fishing, and until next time, stay hooked. I'm Stu, a British military veteran, and predator angling runs deep in my veins. It's about wild waters, the chase, and a way of life. If you enjoyed this adventure, hit subscribe. And if you want to go even further, join my channel memberships for raw, unfiltered predator sessions and exclusive films you won't see anywhere else. This is hooked on predator fishing and until next time stay hooked